Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us this evening. My name is Elena with Napa Bookmine. I am so happy to be here with David Carl and Stephen Pine tonight to discuss two books. The first is Stephen's, The Pyrocene, How We Created an Age of Fire and What Happens Next. Stephen is Professor Emeritus at Arizona State University and author of many books on the history and management of fire, including this one, A Fire, fire A Brief History, Second Edition, and Between Two Fires, a Fire History of Contemporary American. Joining Stephen in conversation this evening is David Carl, who has written Introduction to Fire in California, the second edition. David is president of the California State Park Rangers Association, a retired park ranger, and the author of 13, 15 now nonfiction books, including Introductions to California's Water, Air, Earth, Soil, and Land, and of course, Fire. Uh, this is the essential guide to California's long relationship with fire updated for the climate change generation and relevant to all of us, of course, here in Napa. So with that being said, again, a reminder, you are more than welcome to put questions and comments throughout the talk into the chat box or just save them until the end when you're welcome to unmute yourself and ask in person. So I'm going to go ahead and mute myself and let Stephen and David take it away. Okay, well, uh, I'm Steve Pine, and uh, thank you for the invitation. I'm here to uh, welcome you to the Pyrocene. And let me give you a, a quick visual introduction to what, what the book's about. Um, it's about fire. It's about fire on earth and fire in humans and how that interaction is played out. And the first part is to remember that fire's been a part of the living landscape as long as plants have been on continents. So we have fossil charcoal over 420 million years ago. This is something that's built into the fabric of life on Earth. But during the Pleistocene, uh, creatures emerged uh, that had the capacity to control ignition, uh, began to manipulate fire. So we got small guts and big heads because we learned to cook food. And then we went to the top of the food chain because we learned to cook landscapes. And now we've become a geologic force because we've begun to cook the planet. We learned uh, how to alter uh, and tweak landscapes uh, simply by controlling ignition, uh, the placing and timing of it, but you're still dependent on what nature makes possible. So the next stage, from my perspective, where agriculture comes in, we begin changing the field structure, expanding, altering, changing seasons, and so forth. But that still isn't enough. Our quest for fire has always been a quest for stuff to burn. So to find more, we went back into the geologic past, into what I think of as lithic landscapes, once living, now fossilized. And we've exhumed them and begun to burn those. And that really is a major phase change, not only for people, but for the planet. Because for one thing, it changes the whole dynamic of our relationship to fire. Previously, it had always been about sources, finding new things to burn and ways to burn them. But now it's about where to put all the effluent, where to put all the waste products uh, from fire. Uh, we're overloading the atmosphere, the oceans, and so forth. In living landscapes, our, our interaction with fire always came with ecological checks and balances. You can only do so much. There's so much you can modify, or the, and then the system doesn't work anymore. But when we're dealing with industrial combustion, uh, we can burn day and night, winter and summer, wet or dry, it doesn't matter. So all of the old ecological interaction is, is essentially uh, stripped away. And that leads to the concern by a number of uh, commentators about our future, that it's not only dire, but strange. And we have no narrative by which to connect it to the past and no analog by which to understand what's coming at us in the future. Well, I'm here to suggest that we do have a narrative. It's a great narrative, one of the oldest we have, which is our relationship with fire, a mutual assistance pact uh, that unfortunately is looking more and more like a Faustian bargain. And the analog is that when you add up all the things we're doing with fire directly and indirectly, I think we're creating the, 
the fire informed equivalent of an ice age. Well, how has fire changed things? Well, domestically, uh, we used to have fire in our houses, our habitats, our, our workspaces. They've all been replaced by uh, power and light and heat from other sources. Our cities used to burn as often as the surrounding countryside. Now, until a couple of decades ago, that has disappeared. Cities banned fire. Well, it's weird to have it come back. It's like watching measles or polio uh, return. And we did the same with agriculture, which had outside of floodplains always relied on fire. Now we use fossil fuels to get fertilizers, pesticides, herbicides, and fossil fuel powered machines to run it. The whole green revolution is really premised on um, fossil fuels and the power. Then the problem comes what happens when we carry it into wildlands uh, further out in the countryside. And this is the kind of shock wave that uh, industrial logging uh, set into motion that gave rise to uh, a need for the state to intervene uh, in the form of conservation. It was a global project. And we went from managing fires or even fighting fires like this in the 1830s to this today in effect, relying on a counter fire, a power source uh, of industrial combustion to meet those flames. And we've reached the point where this is no longer adequate. Under the bad conditions that are being created, uh, partly by the, the overall character of a fossil fuel civilization, not just climate, um, we've got fires that are now beyond our control, no matter how many fuels we have. So all this happened in the absence of anthropogenic climate change. 50 years ago, the federal agencies began changing their policy. They recognized we had a fire crisis, but now uh, it's metastasized into something larger. Well, the Pleistocene, the last 2.6 million years was a time of repeated ice ages, um, great ice masses on several of the continents, all kinds of peripheral, phenomenon, pluvial lakes, permafrost, outwash plains, list plains, drops in sea level, and mass extinctions were all sort of key features of that time, uh, broken by short, warm interglacials uh, that didn't last very long. And that's also the era in which our hominin ancestors arrived to take control of fire, shown here bringing stuff to the fire to burn. Well, in the Pyrocene, Instead of Milankovitch cycles, we're looking at the rhythms or odd rhythms of anthropogenic fire. Fire informed by odors uh, are replacing ice everywhere. Uh, the ice is in retreat. All the creatures uh, and organisms that depended on ice uh, are in retreat. Uh, large biogeographic shifts are underway. We have all these kinds of peripheral landscapes are affected as well. And we might consider these enormous smoke balls as the equivalent of outwash plains uh, from, from ice fields. We have change in sea level. We have another wave of mass extinction. And we have humans now reacting in a different way to fire. This is a scene from the Fort McMurray fire in Alberta. Fort McMurray created to mine tar sands. Um, a very dirty fossil fuel. Uh, now, uh, we f the city finds itself burning its candle at both ends, uh, being uh, visited by large wild um, forest fires out of the boreal uh, environment around them, and now running from the flames uh, that uh, are now overfueled, if you will, uh, and threaten to uh, overrun them. So add it all up, and I think we're looking at a pyrocene. So you've lived the story. Now's your chance to read the book. And with that, I'll, I'll yield to uh, I'll yield to David. David, thank you. I'll see if I can be uh, cover as much in such a short time. Let me share my screen and. Start this slideshow from the beginning. Here we go. 
I hope you're seeing that. Should be looking at the cover of, of the introduction to Firebook, which came out a month ago in August. Well, that's it's November now. I can't say that anymore. It came out in August. Um, what I want to do is just give you a quick overview of how this book that focuses on the story, but uh, specifically for California, uh, is structured. Um, it uh, opens in a, with a whole a part that is dealing with the question about what is fire, um, what happens to what's necessary to happen to uh, uh, in terms of fuel and ignition sources um, to to create fire and um, and then it moves on to uh, uh, a segment that is uh, is really a natural history segment looking at uh, across California in each of the various types of major landscape provinces and vegetation zones, um, how fire is, has worked and how the, the plants and, and vegetation has uh, adapted to whatever the presence is and the frequency of, of natural fire and, and fires in, in recent decades that aren't so natural. So for example, this is um, not too far from folks in Napa. Uh, this picture was taken in the hills near Berryessa uh, some years ago, and I uh, came through uh, the spring after a fire had burnt two shrublands there, and this incredible fire followers event was happening where these poppies and, and brogia were, were coming up, uh, plants that are able to wait. Not every year produce this kind of flower flowering display, but but in a response to post-fire conditions when things are there's less competition and there's uh, nutrients available that weren't before, they they take off. And this is just one example across the state, and that's that's uh, one part of this second part of the book. Then there's a segment in the middle that looks at uh, the flames of history. Um, basically, looks at uh, some of the, the information that, that Steve just was, was speaking about in terms of how humans um, have, have uh, thought about fire and, and reacted to it. Um, this is a, a poster from uh, over a century ago now, um, back when there were major debates in, um, in California about the question of light burning, which today you would recognize uh, basically as, as a thing that's talked about a lot as prescribed burning, the use of fire to accomplish um, ends. So um, one of the things um, in the next segment is, uh, which is called burning questions, has to do with the challenges that we, we face now in California in relation to fire. And so I have three pictures I want to show you that relate to policy and challenges. This is um, giant sequoias in the Mariposa Grove in Yosemite National Park as they appeared in 1890. Note the figures standing at their base. They look tiny. They're just normal sized human beings, but these, of course, are the giants of the world, these giant sequoias. Take a look at the tree on the left in particular. It has a big fire scar. It's very, it's very much alive, but it has a big you know, distinctive feature there. So this is 80 years later. In 1970, by that time, the policy of fire exclusion had been in effect in the national parks. And um, this was the response of uh, shade tolerant uh, species of conifers of, of, of fir trees mostly came in underneath and around these giant sequoias that had naturally uh, had a, an open areas where frequent fire had kept, kept this kind of thing from happening. And I'm happy to say that um, a few years ago, my, my wife posed for this picture in that same location, that same tree there on the left. Um, the, the National Park Service in Yosemite had been working for decades now um, to restart conditions that are proper and protective for these, these special trees that are, have lots of adaptations to fire in terms of their fire ecology adaptations. And they really actually require fire to reproduce. So that's been an issue um, just in the last month in regards to uh, fire and uh, some of the other sequoia groves in the Southern Sierra Nevada where things haven't necessarily been, been uh, prepared so well. So in terms of, of history, just a, a little quick graph here that's, that I have just found today, actually, it was an update on one that was uh, came out in 2020. Um, this just is to show you, um, since the, the a lot of record keeping began in terms of, of fires in California, this is specific to California, 
look at what's happened in the last just two years. And, and if you go back through the last uh, uh, 12 years or so, um, uh, an, an, an amazing um, increase in the size and number, uh, particularly in the size, not so much in the number of fires in these recent years. And that's one of those things that the book is trying to address and to make sense of. Um, so I wanted to mention that uh, last year in 2020, the there was over, around 4.2 million acres burned in California, which the news, the media made much of that. It's a, it's a, a, a big number for us in uh, uh, when looking back through the last decades. But we need to realize that uh, the best estimates of what was happening in California before the Spanish arrived um, uh, is that over 5 million acres probably experienced fire each year ignited naturally by lightning or by the uh, native people, the indigenous people of California for their, their own purposes. Um, I, I used the words here um, that they, these acreage experienced fire. And I'm not, I not, didn't want to use the word burned or burned by because um, the, the kind of fire that was happening was much more moderate because it was much more frequent and widespread and uh, the fuels basically were not allowed to build up in the kinds of ways that we've, we've seen in, um, in a lot of places. So this is where we're going, to, uh, well, the book goes next into this whole thing about being ready as hum humans today, as Californians who are living in this very fire prone, very fire hazardous, landscape of California, almost almost every part of California, lesser part, places up in the really high altitude of the Sierra or out in the, the some of the desert areas. But um, so we don't, this is, this is a, you know, a dramatic picture showing that, you know, every, something that all of you are aware of, I'm sure that we have a problem and we've had that problem increasingly in recent decades. And so I just, for what, uh, among the, the 111 pictures in this book, by the way, um, I, I wanted to show you this one because um, it's, it's not always hopeless that if you live in a fire prone landscape like this one in the Eastern Sierra where I live, uh, Jeffrey Pine Forest, um, one of my neighbors has, has built a, an extremely well thought out house with the right kind of roof and the right kind of wall materials and no gaps for uh, embers to get into and under uh, the deck, any of those things. So all of those kinds of things that we can think about and we can do to prepare to harden homes and to create defensible space, those are all aspects of what's covered in this book. Um, I wanted to just mention a little bit about that uh, 2020 uh, uh, year, fire year because along with the, the flames comes smoke and this image from space of the Creek fire on a day that it encountered an incredible number of dead trees and, and it just blew up with an enormous amount of energy release. Um, it's just, is part of the story, part of the story that, that uh, Stephen Pine just talked to us about, about um, you know, what's been happening in, in the recent decades because of the change in climate. And that's, that's the dilemma and the challenge that we're faced with. I went looking, since I knew this was going to be an audience that might be from the Napa area, I went looking for a picture, and um, this one is in the book. I had to pay Noah uh, the, the photographer's rights to, to use it, um, Noah Berger. Um, but this was, uh, I'm putting it in because the recent update was necessary for a number of reasons, not just because of changes in behavior of, of mega fires and and uh, what's been happening with that. But also uh, in 2020, all of a sudden, dealing with fires also was a matter of dealing with the COVID crisis and, and this uh, irony of the Napa County Senior Center uh, with this you know, sign about masks and, and then here comes fire to, to just complicate everything's to no end. There's a number of, of those kinds of topics that needed to be updated and dealt with in this new edition of the book. Um, and so I'll just leave it at that so we can have some time for conversation. But um, I, I do wanna read this quote from Professor Harold Biswell. He's one of the pioneers in terms of an academic. He worked for the forestry department at UC Berkeley and he, he um, wrote this, it's that, that we should keep in mind that fire is a natural part of the environment, about as important as rain and sunshine. Now, when we're dealing with the tragedies of, of what fire has done to communities as fires come back into 
towns and and even some of our major cities. Think about Santa Rosa a few years ago. I don't want to. Um, uh, I'm sure Biswell would not say that you know that we don't uh, recognize that tragedy. But we we what I guess my point would be here in in using that quote is to remind us that we can become one of the species if we choose to that is fire adapted to our environment as so many other plant and animal species have adapted to the fire conditions of California. And I hope my book uh, helps with, with some of that to help people accomplish that. So thank you and I'll stop sharing and we can get back to the rest of this. Uh, thank you both so much. I don't know if you two want to talk. I do have some questions. So if you two wanted to chat for a bit without me, I'm perfectly happy to shut my mouth or I can start us off. Go ahead, I'll, Steve. I'll just make uh, an observation. I, I think there's another lesson out of that uh, photo, uh, David, uh, from the Senior Center at, at Napa uh, within the COVID context and in many ways protecting communities. I mean, you can think of fire as a contagion, a contagion of combustion It spreads in much the same ways. And the way to protect houses, well, you harden them against embers. And that's like wearing masks against aerosols. And you uh, create a safe zone, a defensible zone around the structure. It's very much like social distancing. And then if you get the community, enough of the community in those conditions, you have something approaching herd immunity. So in some ways, we can use that experience to say we are going it's out there uh, and we can either, we can either moderate it by uh, taking vaccines and practicing proper social behavior or COVID will do it on its own. And in similar ways, we can take steps to learn to live with fire or we can have feral flame that is going to do it in the most destructive ways, so. I love that. That's a <laughs> nice analogy. And I would just throw in one more thing that I just, as you're talking, I, I thought about was that I've, as I've written about is uh, that, you know, the history that of how we approached fire once we, uh, back a, a little over a century ago, uh, got into the fire suppression mode, um, basically became a war, yeah. um, very, very much warlike uh, militaristic battle campaigns that go on and trying to fight these these uh, fires and 98 percent of the time actually that that response has been is pretty effective but in, especially in recent years all of a sudden we're getting these monsters that are uh, overwhelming the, the the militaristic if i can use that word uh, the, the fire suppression uh equipment and, and manpower that is thrown at them um, and just uh, impossible until we get something like what happened this month, where several of the biggest fires in California are now under control because the snow came and the rain came. And, and that's often the only thing that finally um, is successful once we get into these completely out of control situations. So um, you know, I, 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 that's, a, that, that's off what you were talking about, about the COVID thing, except that just a response. It's a, it's an attitude that I guess that we're striving for when we say that there, there's a maybe we hope a better way. Well, that's a that's a great point too. I mean, federal firefighting actually began with the cavalry, which uh, ran the national parks, beginning with Yellowstone in 1886. They put out 60 fires that first summer, and then uh, at Yosemite and uh, Sequoia. Um, the cavalry were also responsible for bringing that in. And then after World War II, we had all this surplus equipment, war equipment, and that was very largely directed to firefighting, either by the federal agencies or through the Forest Service to the states. And so there was a sense that we're, we're kind of in a cold war on fire. We're going to apply this mass, we'll mobilize the machines, we'll mobilize science on the war, example and we will we will suppress it and that has been a failed strategy uh, there are certainly places for controlling fires uh, particularly around communities but extending that into the wider landscape 
uh, has been a failed strategy. That's a, a kind of a forward strategy if you want to take the military analogy, run amok. Uh, it, you just put more and more in and, and you lose. We can control all the easy fires and the ones under worse conditions, which are the ones that are really doing the damage, we can't. And, uh, and 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 then that brings me, you know, I, I mentioned a minute ago um, in one of my slides about how many acres the uh, the native people of the state used to burn uh, for for specific benefits, um, and and the, one of the one of the things to keep in mind when you think about that is that there was a population of around they think three hundred thousand. California um, indigenous people. And today, what are we? We're, we're very close to 40 million people in California. And where are we planted? Well, there um, many of them are in the Southern California chaparral community, with, which is incredibly fire prone. And many of them are in more and more in um, that, like the Sierra Foothill communities, wow. Auburn, Grass Valley, those places. Uh, places where we were putting more and more people um, in the line of fire. And, um, and, and so if we're dealing with tragedy now, part of it is because there are so many of us in places that maybe shouldn't be even. There's, a, there's, a, it's, there's a, some stuff in my book about the debate about the, this policy question about, you know, are we, are we willing to, to take these hard decisions as, a, as governments and, and as a society about should people be given permission if they if, uh, possibly uh, in terms of zoning and things to, to put more homes into places that have extreme fire risk. You know, so it's, a, it's a dilemma. Well, we haven't been very successful at keeping people out of floodplains or coastal plains subject to hurricanes. So it's really tough to tell Americans where and how to build, but that's essentially what it what it will take to, if you want to keep these communities um, stable and protected. Actually, with that, Elena, have you got some questions? Yeah, I, I have like a half page of questions here of, of stuff that I would love to ask you about. And then we also have some questions um, that are coming into me from the chat that um, I'm going to be selfish because I'm the host of this event and ask mine first or one of them first, not all of them. Um, and then I know Jordan had a question. So um, Jordan, feel free to pop on um, when the answer to mine starts going. Um, I guess it's not so much a question as a comment and, and what your thoughts are on this that I've always felt and I feel like both of your presentations have crystallized that fire is not a problem in and of itself. The problem is that people and houses have put themselves in the way of it. And so the sense of, is it is it actually getting worse or are, is our spread what's getting worse or is the human caused climate change what's getting worse? Or do we just have better um technology for tracking these things so we know that it's happening whereas it always used to happen that's a very amorphous topic and i apologize for that so if you have any thoughts on that i'd love to hear them david well my answer to your series of ways of questioning that is is yes <laughs> maybe i think all of the above um but it it in the last few years, the last five years, maybe even the last two years, um, there's been something else that's that needs to be thought about and tried to explain. And that, I think, the answer there's well, I, I'm not. It's not just me, but there's there's more and more researchers who are answering this question that climate change has a strong signature behind what's been happening, particularly most recently. Now, you mentioned, but is it because there's more people? Well. The, the one reason that the last 30 years of climate warming has happened is because about every 30 years we've been doubling the population on the planet and people are the reason why all of this carbon dioxide is being released from its fossil sources. And so, yes, there's that too. And I forget what the other one was, but um, whether, was it always happening? Fire has always happened. And I I'm, I'm think, Steve, maybe I'll turn that over to Steve. There's no question about that. 
the question has been, uh, you know, our relationship with fire. Yeah, that's, I mean, if, if human beings vanished overnight from the planet, fire would still continue. It would, it would have different forms, but it would continue. Uh, we could not continue without fire. I mean, fire in many ways made us. We, we are a uniquely fire creature on a uniquely fire planet. And that's managing fire is our ecological signature. That's what we do that no other creature does. And so in some ways, fire made us what we are. Um, good fire, but bad fire, <laughs> the misuse of may unmake us. Uh, but that's still us, and that's still us in my in my framing of it, being the Earth's fire creature. So um, one of the things uh, I try to do in in the Pyrocene is to tell the story. Yes, uh, we know that uh, land management is a huge component. How we live on the land, how we build our houses, and run our agriculture. We, we know uh, that climate change is important, uh, is to try to present a, a continuous narrative of how all this grows out of the human use and misuse of fire. Um, so we're responsible, every aspect you pick, I mean, places like California are built to burn and they're built to burn explosively from time to time, but everything we have done has aggravated the situation. And climate change is acting as a performance enhancer. Um, and at some point, there are lots of things we can do to mitigate. We could, we could protect communities in a handful of years if we chose to. And we could, we could get our landscapes in pretty good shape in a couple of decades if we chose to. Uh, but all of that will be overwhelmed by uh, climate change if we don't handle that at the same time. So I, my sense is that we need to do all these things. They will have different timelines to completion, uh, but we can't wait for one of them and then do the other. They all need to be done um, in parallel. But we're responsible for all of it. <laughs> so what we did, we can undo. Uh, it, it's not like you know, unscrewing a light bulb that you put in. There'll be a lot of unanticipated consequences <laughs> because you're dealing with biological and social systems. And we don't know how all these things are gonna interact. But we can certainly, we can certainly begin unwinding what we put together. Awesome! Thanks for uh, taking a stab at that complicated thought I lobbed in your directions. Well, maybe we should ask you. Uh, you're there in Napa, and Napa's had some been surrounded um, and entered um, by fire in recent years. Um, how'd it go? <laughs> and how what did you experience? Um, I mean, I can't speak for everybody else who's on this video for sure, but for myself, I mean, uh, my parents' home burned in the Atlas Fire in 2017 up uh, Soda Canyon. Um, they, unlike almost all of their neighbors, elected not to rebuild and instead bought a home in a neighborhood closer to within Napa city limits. Um, but nearly everybody else um, rebuilt, and part of that and this kind of ties into another question I had or something I wanted to bring up was the way that insurance is structured is that if you um, rebuild in the same footprint, you get a lot more money than if you decide not to rebuild and want to buy a new house elsewhere. Um, and I believe that's similar to flood insurance as well, which is why you get people who rebuild homes again and again and again on floodplains and how what a wasted Sisyphusian effort that is. Um, and then I know, uh, you know, the fires up near St. Helena where we have a bookshop as well and a lot of customers as well. I can't remember the exact number, something like 600 structures burned and the majority of those were houses. I could be wrong if somebody on this call knows, otherwise please correct me. Um, so we knew people who lost homes then. What's funny, of course, is that vineyards are natural fire breaks. So a lot of Napa County agricultural land is vineyard, um, which very rarely burns, although I think in the ones in St. Helena, 
um, there was some vineyard burnt because um, it was just too close and too hot. Um, so the, but you can get smoke taint issues with the grape production. Um, and so I know that recent, with this last set of fires, a lot of um, wineries didn't bother making wine from, you know, the grapes that they harvested. They just assumed it was all smoke tainted or they tested it and it was all smoke tainted and they just didn't bother. So it's certainly affecting our environment. Um, water availability is a, is a huge factor here in Napa. Um, if you really want to start a fight, you get a group of people together to talk about water in Napa County, um, which we learned the hard way at an event that we hosted a few years ago. Um, <laughs> although we're having a wonderfully wet fall so far, which is incredible. I mean, we haven't had rain like this. Uh, we had upwards like over five inches of rain in a 36 hour period about a week and a half ago which was more rain than the entire 2020, 2021 growing season. So who knows what's happening these days? I'm kind of hoping, I don't know if you guys have any idea, David, maybe you know, whether maybe fire season is over early this year. It depends where you are in California. Uh, in Northern California, the, at least some of the fire agency people have been willing to say, yes, maybe that seems to be the case. But this is now the, the, the time when Southern California chaparral shrublands typically burn the most when, in, in conjunction whenever there's Santa Ana winds. And, um, so they, and they didn't get much rain, anywhere near as much rain as, as Northern California did. So we can't say for California that the fire season is over and for the California fire agency people, they, they pretty much have a, a you know, declared that California doesn't have a, a limited fire season. It has a year-round fire season. It just, where, where it gets expressed, uh, shifts around. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that sounds about right for our reality. Um, I know Jordan had uh, messaged me earlier with a question. So Jordan, I don't know if you want to go ahead and unmute or ask that now. You can go for it. Thanks, Elena. I don't know whether you're getting any video of me, but I don't think you need it. No, can but you, we can hear you. Yeah, good. Um, I, I'd propose that everybody who buys a house somewhere outside of the city limits west of the 100 Meridian should be given a copy of each of these books <laughs> as a sort of introduction to what they're doing. Is this Jordan Fisher Smith, by the way? Of course. I, I thought I recognized your voice, Jordan. Oh, and yeah. as a fellow author, I, I like your suggestion in terms of possibly getting your book sold, but I, I also like your suggestion just because of the topic. Go ahead. I'm sorry to interrupt. Yeah, I, I wondered where the figure of 5 million, uh, the um, indigenous or you know, pre-European figure of my 5 million came from, 5 oh. million acres annual burn. Yeah, California. Uh, actually, I saw it actually on a bigger figure, five and a half million. Um, of course, these are estimates based on a number of things. But uh, the reason why it's been in the news recently, um, I'd have to go and dig out a specific reference for you, but is that more and more policy has been to work uh, to recognize that there's this um, Native Californian knowledge and Native American knowledge across the West. Um, in relation to this this history they have of working with fire, and um, there, there's a, there's a, a very specific effort underway now in California uh, through the state government uh, and, and state agencies to bring in and, and work with that knowledge of the of the people and uh, specifically I read a lot about the people up on the north north coast, um, but. Um, uh, but, but across the state, uh, basically, the, there's, there's a recognition of native. And, and, and so in reading about all of that, there's been this number has been emerged. And, and it's sort uh, of thrown around by different people. And yeah, uh, not just thrown around, I don't think. I think there's, there's something to back it. But uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I don't think that's surprising. I, I, but I, as long as we recognize that 
when we talk about it, it we're talking about a whole you know mosaic of you know sometimes uh, probably intense fire and a whole lot of not very intense and a whole lot of small purposely set fires so yeah there's a qualitative difference yeah yeah uh -huh. and no air tankers <laughs> We, we actually have some historic photos of light burning going on uh, in Northern California. Uh, this is actually in the fall of 1910, Yeah, uh, several images. And these are not, even like the prescribed fires we think of today, where you, you have sort of this stampede of bison or something going through the forest, this kind of wave of flame. It, it is really like a swarm of mice going yeah. through it is it is chewing away it is small stuff small scale the point is that it's relentless it's done year after year and it it keeps things um dampened to the point where it won't blow blow up in the you know as we're seeing now so it's not just whether you have fire or not it's the context of those fires and now we have a context that makes it difficult for us to put back those historic fires of a century or more ago, because the, the conditions have changed. So we need to find, you know, what's the modern analog for it? And I'd like to make one, one comment on your, your west of the 100th meridian. Uh, I'm all in favor of, of your proposal, but, uh, you know, we've had this prevailing story that the problem with communities burning in these large feral fires is it's a California pathology or it's a western quirk dumb westerners building houses where there are fires but we're starting to see thanks to land use and climate change that the fires are going to where the houses are i mean gatlinburg tennessee is not exactly in the sierra foothills and other communities in the southeast are being hit and places um east of the hundredth meridian uh, are being hammered and often these are by power line <laughs> ignitions similar things so in a way we're nationalizing the story uh, and the fires are going to where the people are and the prescribed burning's all going to florida <laughs> it always has been yeah, yeah. They've, they've done a better job through the through the years in the south uh, not just florida in terms of a, an attitude that allowed for burning in their forests than than most of the rest of the country and um, some of that history is in a little of that is touched on in my book, but uh, but I know Jordan. Uh, everyone should look for Jordan Fisher Smith, and uh, he's he's got a, a pretty good, a very good book uh, that that tells some more of that kind of story too across, uh, uh, particularly in parklands. So there's a plug, Jordan. Thank you. For the other two, for the, uh, how many people here are not actually involved in this, in this conversation? I see three names. Yeah, maybe. Mm -hmm. David, what, what do you see as the, the, uh, if I you take out your crystal ball, the reburn interval and the, and what, what's going to reburn and how in the Sierra, for example, the Creek Fire? You're talking to me, not the David who you, you were seeing like you were addressing other people in, the, in this meeting. Um, well, good question. The, because of the type of fire that the Creek Fire was, um, my, what, I, what I've known since, what I've heard since, uh, since it happened, this was, a, this was a fire that burned on, in the San Joaquin drainage on the west side of the Sierra. Uh, ended up burning for so long um, that it, it it became the largest single fire, not a complex of fires um, uh, that that the state had ever had. Um, and so, but but like most, it's, it's not surprising for those who look into fire and know about fire. Like most big fires, um, it, it's not uniform burning. The, and across, I'm hearing that across that. Um, that expanse of, of this was mostly in, in pine forest, um, some some in shrublands of the of the foothills, some in oak woodlands, all of that. But across that, there there was the expected mix of some areas that are completely crown fire torched, and others that uh, you know were barely touched, 
And even I was, I, if, if I may jump out to another example, I just saw a uh, talk the other day about the coast redwoods that burned in Big Basin Redwoods State Park. And even there, they're finding that fires that are crown firing, the crowns that burnt all the way up in these very you know, giantly tall coast redwoods, they're seeing uh, where, you, where you would have thought maybe there, there was going to be complete mortality. They're seeing uh, um, epicormic sprouting, sprouting from the branches uh, and, and up in towards the, the tops of these trees. So, you know, the, 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 I guess what I'm getting at is that the answer as to what, what's going to come next is that uh, there's going to be decades of recovery and there'll be maybe some places won't come back looking the same they used to, or maybe they will. But um, fire is interesting that way. I, I, we, we often talk about how many acres burned and, and don't think about the subtleties that are going on in terms of recovery. And, and the recovery in fires is one of the most fascinating things I think there is in, in nature. And that's why there's a whole segment in, in my book about uh, um, you know, the, the, the adaptations across all these different types of vegetation types to, to fire that have evolved um, in, in, in response to fire. Steve, you. looking yeah. like you, you want to say something. No, I, uh, I was just, you, you sparked a, another thought. Uh, how many times, the difference between nature's ability to respond and recover from fire and human communities. And time and time again, you see these aerial views of cities leveled by fire. I think of the campfire is probably the best doc. And yet the trees on all sides mm -hmm. are doing fine. Same fire. They, it burned differently with different severity and consequences in each, but one was adapted to fire, was prepared to roll with it, and one was not. And so we can learn a lot from nature and what happens in our cities isn't necessarily what's happening in landscapes unless we've done other things in the landscapes to interrupt uh, or, or break down the capacity of nature to recover. I mean, nature has been doing this for a very, as long as there's been terrestrial life on earth, it's been accommodating fire. And up until, you know, a hundred or so years ago, people were doing pretty well. I mean, mega fires are a pathology of developed countries. How is that? <laughs> It's so interesting to me. I mean, there does seem to be a lesson in resiliency to be learned from the way that the natural world responds to and embraces fire. And my question is, you know, we are such a young species compared to a tree. Can we learn fast enough? I, I don't know if we can. Are we, are we smart enough? Are we smart enough to figure out how to do it? Yes. Are we smart enough to actually put it into practice in time? That's another question. I'm, I'm feeling pretty good about some of the, you know, the government response thing about money. Uh, there, there's funding coming down that is from both the state and from the national government now that is uh, intended to not just be more fire trucks and firemen and fire equipment, fire fighting equipment, but to, to finally, we've known how to do it for decades, really, um, for a long, long time, but finally start changing our approach and, and to step away from that hubris that we can, we can just fight the fires. You know, we, we've learned we cannot. And, I, and, I'm, and this is all happening in the last two years of budgets, um, some very um, hopeful things. I hope, I mean, I'm hopeful anyway, that they'll help, but we'll see. We've got to get this, I don't know what, what's happening with the you know, climate change probably, whether we're, ever, we're gonna, I don't feel hopeful about that one, I'm afraid, just after what's not happening and when the government, the folks get together to talk about that around the world. Well, I'll, I'll put in as, uh... The significance of California for the rest of us in this, California moving at a state and federal level uh, to treat fire differently 
that is an enormous phase change for the state. And if California can begin doing that, that will set a powerful example throughout the West and indeed for the country. I mean, California is a huge disturbance in the force for the American <laughs> fire establishment. And if it moves, the rest of the rest of the country will as well. So it, we all we all have a stake in California making the hard choices and, and begin redirecting its efforts. And, and we need to, we, maybe motivation comes from hearing about the problem with the wine industry. You know, we, we, have, we all got to take care of that problem. We can't have our wine be smelling of, I don't know what the <laughs> contamination of smoke is, but that's a, I actually have no idea what smoke taint actually does to wine. If anybody knows, please let me know. I, I our um, co-owner is one of the, one of whom works very actively in the bookstore, but the other has a day job in the wine business. So really I should just ask Eric what happens. I don't, I think it, I don't think it tastes or smells like smoke. I think it affects the chemical composition so that it smells and tastes gross. I but I don't know <laughs> what exactly that's like. Like I know what cork taint smells like. We got to solve that problem, but I, and I don't want to be facetious, but uh, that is, that's a real problem, and it's 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 yeah. obviously there. It's one of those things, and and yes, there are pictures. I I uh, in writing about the history of 2017, I strongly considered including a picture in my book of the grapevines with fire moving through them. Then some of that did happen, direct direct burning, but um, yeah. I mean, I think. Oh, I was just gonna make a joke that the lesson is that everybody should plant vineyards around their house. Right, we should all just become home uh, winemakers. Don't talk water. <laughs> yeah. Right, there's a water story yeah. there too. Well, I, I one of the interesting things that's happened in the last few years, though, is the role of smoke and uh, huge smoke palls that are now drifting across the country and smoking in large urban areas. And this is bringing the fire situation to a lot of urban concentrations that otherwise fire is just a remote thing that happens on their screens and doesn't really affect them. Oh, it's tragic, it's something happened. And then we go on to the next story. When San Francisco or Portland, Seattle are smoked in for days or weeks, that changes things. Right. Um, and I've thought of some of these giant smoke palls as sort of the, the fire equivalent of the Dust Bowl. Uh, storms that roiled across into the eastern U.S., even made it to the steps of the Capitol, and suddenly that got people's attention. That for otherwise was just this quirky thing that happened in some out of the way place. And that's a, you know, an example of something that has changed. These these massive fires produce these massive smoke events, and. Um, one of the complaints that the, the burners, the prescribed burn folks have is that they've been stopped from burning many, many times because of the air quality restrictions. Um, and yet when you look at what the smoke they produce uh, in a controlled manner in a much lesser uh, of a smoke event uh, as a way to try to avoid these massive events, um, it, it's, it's short-sighted. We've got to, we, and they're working on that too. There's, there's some hope there that, uh, yeah. The folks who could do manage the air quality question um, recognize, or I, I'm, I hear uh, that you know we can't just be the simplistic. No, PM10 can't be that much, and, and the end of discussion. That uh, we we have this greater need now to to endure some lesser smoke to avoid future impacts. We we may have to deal with seasonal smoke like we do seasonal pollen. Yeah. And some people are going to be affected and will have to take measures. But otherwise, the, the alternative is to just be immersed in really dangerous uh, smoke conditions for prolonged, I mean, killer fog equivalent conditions for a period of time. Question for Steve. Uh, since it, between the time that you published Fire in America, which was, I think, 1983, and now a lot has changed. How have your views changed aside from the great changes in the circumstances 
how have you changed about fire? That's a good question. And I, I think the big change for me is that uh, I decided that rather than dig deeper into the American story, uh, I would I would go uh, comparative history and see how our history differed from Australia or Canada or Europe or Russia or other parts of the world. And that gave me a, a, a deeper grounding in the cultural conditions that shape fire and landscapes. Uh, but my sense of fire and the significance of fire um, has not significantly changed. Uh, what's happened is the world changed around me. <laughs> And it was something which was sort of, well, this is odd, but it didn't really connect with anything else to suddenly, hey, this suddenly speaks to stuff that, that seems to matter. So actually, it, we've got a minute or two. I'll direct a question back to you, Jordan. I mean, you've studied what went on during the transition 50 years ago when we were trying to change fire policy and practice and begin fire restoration. What in your sense went wrong or what, what caused it to stall rather than continue to build up momentum? Well, I think you put your finger on it in a manuscript I recently read uh, about fire in Yosemite, the history of fire in Yosemite. You said something like that with, uh, with uh, beneficial fire, it's all subtractive and not additive. So there are all kinds of reasons not to ignite a prescribed burn uh, on the day that you plan to do it. Yeah. There are more reasons not to than there are to do it. Um, and the same is true for allowing a wilderness fire to burn. There's always, you know, I, I think it's clear that um, uh, nobody ever got disciplined for putting out a fire too fast. But people feel that when they allow fire to do its work, if anything goes wrong, their career is in jeopardy. And I think there was a generation of people uh, who came up, came into firework in the 70s and 80s, who just had the fire in them about fire. And they felt this was the right thing to do. And they were willing to take risks. But I don't know that that race of people is being duplicated and continued. And there was this, there was this burst of activity in the 80s. Uh, and I don't know that those people are still there. People in the agencies tell me that there's a great reticence or risk aversion. And I think uh, Dan Buckley, you know, mm -hmm. who we know, at Yosemite is an example of that older race, you know, he's an older guy who came up in that bloom of activity. The hardest thing about political change is to keep it going, you know? Yeah. So I don't know, I, I, yeah. I feel very much on the spot being asked any question by you. <laughs> I'm always learning, I believe it. I learned a, a, an awful lot at Yosemite, it was, uh, it was nice to see it grounded in waves. And I, I, I came away with a much greater appreciation for the extent of Native American burning. I mean, all of the prime sites, Yosemite Valley, uh, the Mariposa Grove, all of those were routinely burned, annually burned. And then large amounts of the backcountry, in addition to lightning, was regularly burned in ways that are almost unfathomable to us now. So you never stop learning. If you do, you, you've stopped living. <laughs> so I'm, I'm not in the grave yet. So I'm always learning and happy to hear your comments. <laughs> if I may see, maybe we have to wrap it up here, Elaine. But yeah. um, I wrote a book 20 years ago called Burning Questions. Yeah. It's an environmental history focused on uh, the debates that were going on um, uh, as, as pioneers in, in trying to return fire to fire starved in, environments were, were emerging and, and, and how they were you know, the shot, shot down or, or how the resistance worked to try to stop them from um, 
you know, being respected and, and to get their, their message out. And, uh, and that, that book's 20 years old now. And the stories that I told are, are more early 20th century type, uh, and mid 20th century and up, up into the seventies, um, stories of, uh, of this evolution that I think maybe now, hopefully we're, we're seeing, um, something moving beyond that. But if you're wondering about what the attitudes were, mm -hmm. what the struggles were for the people who were yeah. trying to bring change, um, that's what I delved into in that book. And it's a great book for... It's hard it's, to find now. <laughs> yeah, but it's a great book for the profiles of the people, the, the sort of the, the small cadre of, of really the sort of... And they weren't young people. We think of revolutionaries being young. These were all middle-aged, in their 50s or so, when, when the main... When they're stuff sort of went public. Uh, it's a very interesting story and uh, you, you, you tell it well in that. Thank so you. it's worth, it's worth, it's worth looking for. It's, it's still in print. If you want to pay a fortune to get it yeah, print on demand copy, <laughs> it's terrible. <laughs> it's not out there on the shelves. So. Yeah, I was just looking for, I think I might've found it. Um, But like yeah, we, we can get it. Um, <laughs> that was good because I was literally just going to ask if either of you knew of any books where they talk about um, indigenous uh, use of fire. Um, because it's really astonishing. I think most of us are not, we're sort of peripher peripherally aware of it, but not really, don't really understand the extent that it happened i think in california you might want to read cat anderson cat mm. uh, anderson is really the scholar who brought this to the public at large how long ago 15 years ago 10 15 years maybe 20 years ago if i look in my cat is k-a-t yeah. it's a good book that is some library you've got there steve oh i'm I'm looking for so her, her book is called Tending the Wild. Tending the Wild, yeah. Native American Knowledge and Management of California's Natural Resources. There you go. There you go. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Good book. Uh, we actually have this on our shelves. I'm looking at it. <laughs> How Kirk. about that? I, I think that's well, I guess I'll have to buy it now, huh? Or somebody can buy it out from under me. That's fine. I won't be mad if one of you buys it. So none of the other. <laughs> folks I sent it directly to Jordan. He didn't need it. Let me send it to everybody else. <laughs> it's another UC Press book. Good old UC. It Press. is yes, and I saw that um, other David put that in the chat as well. well. David, I think you were prescient in getting yourself what maybe 20, 30 years ago into a landscape where there was nothing to burn but tufa towers. <laughs> well, I wish that was true, but my fire and my home insurance just went up, and I think it's because I am in a fire risk uh, environment. Sagebrush, scrub, and pinyon juniper are are uh, they don't burn as often as some other landscapes, but when they burn, they burn hot. I've heard PJ burns pretty good. Yeah, but not very often. No, because we keep running around putting out the little lightning fires. <laughs> Well, um, we are past eight o'clock, which is perfectly fine. So if anybody has any last questions for David or Stephen um, about the piracine, about fire in California, I'll give it a couple seconds before we wrap things up. If anybody wants to unmute or put it in the chat, I'm not seeing anything. Okay, any, any last thoughts you would like to leave us with tonight? Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Awesome, well, thank you both. Um, this is such an important topic for our area and I'm sure it will continue to be an important topic. Um, so the next time one of y'all writes a book about fire, we'll just have to have you back and hopefully we can do that in person. We'll see, hopefully. <laughs> Eventually you know, we'll get back to in-person events. It's very interesting the way that we, we all, writers and authors and publishers really worried about our independent bookstores and you know 
dying because of the internet. And suddenly with the, with the COVID pandemic, we have this, uh, this uh, content coming out of independent bookstores, these great conversations uh, that anybody can join from anywhere in the world. And it's, it, it's sort of an amazing um, unseen outcome of the pandemic. And I want to thank you, Elena, for making this, making these two authors available to us. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Jordan. And thank you to David at UC Press, who is on this call as well, for, for pitching this. It's right up our alley. And I know, I hope that even when we can back to, get back to in-person events, that we will be able to have a virtual component um, for accessibility reasons, for people to call in from anywhere, to be able to participate in the conversation. Um, I think it's really important that we have both and I can't wait to have both. It'll be, it'll be great. Um, it's, it's wonderful sometimes the things technology does if we use it right. Um, so thank you all so much for joining us. Again, the recording of this event will be up on our YouTube page in um, a few days, probably today's Wednesday, maybe Friday, probably Monday. Um, thank you all so much. Have a good evening. Um, and we'll hope to see you next time. Bye-bye.